Welcome back to some more. We are here for the tour of the S35, part two of the interior. And the only reason that I'm able to stand in the hatch like this and uh, speak to you is because this is one of the vehicles that was captured by the Germans. They replaced the ridiculous dome cupola with this much more sensible door cupola that you can actually get in and out the top. However, I shall pause momentarily to allow the camera to relocate so you can see just how relative a statement that is. Okay, so now the camera has moved a little bit more vertically down into the hatch, you can see this is a very narrow hatch. Now, for all the comments people make about my being too tall to be a tanker, I am not a particularly wide gentleman. And it took me several minutes of struggling before I realized that it was pretty much impossible for me to turn around. There have got just too many bits and pieces poking into me. So the only conclusion I have really is that this is purely for visibility and it's not so much of getting in and out thing. Uh, incidentally, I'm standing on the commander's seat. So what I'll do is I shall attempt now to get a little bit lower down and then open up the hatch at the rear of the turret. Okay. Right, now and down, it's a simple hand crank. So this plug type door, which can only be opened from the inside of the turret, was the primary way of the commander sticking his head out. It actually sit on the back here. Uh, of course, being only openable from inside, to get inside the first place, he's got to come in the side hatch with pretty much everybody else. The good news though is that this now allows us a place to place the camera, that they can look inside and see what the commander is doing in this one-man turret. The first five vehicles were built with the APX-1 turret. This was a smaller one-man turret and soundly lambasted for many reasons. After the first five, they then moved to the APX-1 CE. CE stood for Chemin à Logis, and that pretty much means wide track or wide rail. And uh, what this did was well, a couple of things. Firstly, it was actually intended to make the turret a little bit more resilient to hits, but it also gave the TC a bit more room. In fact, so much more room that the radio operator could help out with some of the tasks like loading the main gun. As a result, this is often considered to be a one and a half man turret. Uh, once you're inside, I am seated on a swivel chair or a swivel seat, I guess. My feet are on two footrests. These will also rotate around freely. The reason that you might want the two footrests instead of just letting your feet dangle is also you can stand on them to get a view out of the rotating cupola. Visibility in here is horrendous. Uh, I have vision slits on each side. I will have the main sight to the front, and that is it. Uh, there are additional three slits up in the cupola, and the cupola will rotate. It's still pretty horrendous, and you can see why they installed the trapdoor at the top when the Germans took it over. Gross Traverse is electric, the little handle up here, and final lay and manual traverse is the handle here. For elevation, it is a simple and fairly smooth worm gear here for the 47 and the coax machine gun. The machine gun is the 7.5 millimeter fortress gun with drum magazines, about 2250 rounds were carried. Optic would be mounted up here and it was possible by pulling out this plunger to disconnect the machine gun and optic and fire them in independent elevation and independent traverse to a limited amount. I've no idea why you would do it, but you could. When you move to the 47mm main gun, the SA-35, it has this neat little folding recoil guard here, so that's out of the way when you're not using it, you're sitting on the uh, back of the turret and your legs are out here. It's basically the same gun that you found on the, say, the Char-1 BIS. And most of the rounds, of the 118 rounds, were armor-piercing. Not a fantastic armor piercing, but armor piercing nonetheless, about four centimeters at 30 degrees at 400 meters. There were a few HE rounds, 
but the primary method of destroying the enemy infantry was going to be the machine gun. That's pretty much all I can say about the turret. It's uh, early war, it's simple. Now let's move down. Now that I'm sitting in the driver's position, I guess I better briefly mention a bloke who's supposed to be sitting to my right, the radio operator. There is a seat, or at least there was one, that's been removed from the vehicle. There was a snag with the radio operator's position in the S35. Most S35s didn't actually have a radio. They were supposed to, uh, they were just never fielded. The ER-28 did start showing up in 1940. Uh, platoon leaders will get the ER-29, which is so useful that a good line of trees will block your transmission. Company commanders will get both an ER-29 and an ER-26 tear, and the ER-27s went to the battalion commander. That's it, with no radio to play with, uh, he was pretty much reduced to either handing the ammunition to the commander or just adding another pair of eyes to the front of the tank. As for the driver, well, I am seated in an adjustable seat. It is as far back as it goes, and my dreams of driving a somewhere are apparently not to come to pass. Uh, the clutch pedal is sufficiently far close towards me that I don't have enough room between the clutch pedal and the steering wheel to place my knee. So I'm not going to go very far. The clutch, of course, is necessary for the five-speed gearbox. Steering is conducted by use of the steering wheel. And what this does is it, uh, well, really, it's just a round version of the tillers. Uh, unlike a regular steering wheel in the car, all that happens is as you turn it, you simply pull either one or another lever on the bottom of the, on the, bottom of the column. Uh, to his right, he has a traditional five-speed manual and a large handbrake is located even further to the right. The vehicle would steer depending on the gear. So in first gear, you basically pivot steer. You'd lock one track and swing around it. In fifth gear, the outside steering radius was 15 meters. Another interesting feature about the tank is the fire suppression system. There are a number of fire bottles, uh, methyl bromide, and they are under pressure. If a fire is detected in the rear of the vehicle, you simply pull down on one of the handles. It pierces the bottle, the gas then escapes under high pressure to discharge ports in the engine compartment. For vision, uh, in obviously low threat environments, he's like this, he's got the spring-loaded visor which springs forward and it's rusted in place so I can't play with it. When he closes it, he's down to simple vision slits, a bit like these. And, well, in addition to being actually pretty horrible to see out of, they come with one or two other concerns. For example, you can see that the metal is much thinner around a vision slit, making it a weak point for anti-tank fire. The other problem is that, well, even small arm bullets will splatter when they hit pieces of metal. So you can imagine that you're standing here, even if you're wearing goggles, it's probably not going to be very effective to protect your face. You have to go back almost to the old face mask, the chain mail of uh, World War I. Because if a bullet impacts this little visor here, little pieces of metal will start coming in. And if you have your head up to it, trying to see out, well, guess what's going to take the pieces of metal? So, um, and not ideal, suffice to say. Uh, eventually, of course, you have uh, uh, vision blocks and uh, periscopes, which make things a lot safer. Behind me and low is an escape hatch. It is of actually quite a reasonable size, albeit it opens upwards, which is a minor flaw. And of course, the main entrance and exit is directly behind me, the main door, through which I will now exit. Finally, the exit door. Uh, it's just the one door for the entire crew, which is not exactly ideal. Uh, at least it's not incredibly small, it's just small. What they've done rather cleverly though, uh, is because the upper hull is slanted inwards, if you push out ordinarily with a parallel hinge, what you'll be doing is you're fighting against gravity, and this is a, it's a pretty heavy armored door. So what they've done is they've sort of ramped the hinge a little bit, so as you push outwards, it goes down and gravity starts to help you once you get over that very initial spot. So uh, now let's give it a go. So you unlock it and then simply push out. And I believe head first. Mm. 
This is not the easiest vehicle to get out of. Probably helps to be a bit shorter. By the start of the war, 246 or so vehicles have been delivered to the front lines. Total production, about 427 by the time the Germans came along and decided to put a stop to it. Indeed, such was the demand for these vehicles they were being rushed out of the factory, that a lot of them came without firing pins, without sights, without radios, or without anti-tank ammunition. After the fall of France, the vehicle continued to see service in North Africa. When the French rejoined the fight on the Allied side, the 19th Armoured Group had this strange combination of Valentines, Samoas, M10s, and Stuarts. They fought in Tunisia. If that wasn't weird enough, by the invasion of France to reconquest, Samoas, Centaurs, and B1s were in service in roughly equal numbers with the 13th Regiment de Dragon. And this was in April 45. The last operational use of the Samoa was April 46, when it was finally withdrawn from French service. It had been used in the occupation force over Germany. In German service, the vehicle could be found anywhere from Norway to Yugoslavia. In addition to the Germans, it was also used by Italy, Bulgaria, and Hungary. There was one additional variant of the S-35 plan, it was the S-40, the improved version, shall we say. This was going to have a hull about 33 centimeters wider, a reconfigured hull shape, that new running gear with the idler wheel which is further up and forward, and there will be an additional roller to fill in the gap between the idler and the front road wheel. It would also have a new turret and a new multi-fuel Hispano engine of about 220 horsepower. Of course, not being around long enough in production to get to number 450, no S40s were made, but there was one exception, a variant, the SAU40. One of these did see service in the fight for France, and this was basically an assault gun, which was an S40 hull with a 7.5 centimeter fortress gun mounted low in the hull. So that's it, your S35. I'll see you on the next one. There's just another way of doing this. It was also used by Bulgaria, Romania, and... Nope. I'm breaking the tank.